physical problems, I can't help but think about the spiritual problems that so many have today and how many are living their lives in the flesh and not in the spirit. And it's, it's so sad because it could be so much better if they would just listen to God's word, if they would just be what he has to say because the message is one of salvation, is one of joy, is one of peace, is one of such comfort that you can't find that from the world. No matter how much money you may have, it will not buy what Jesus freely gives to us today. And it's our privilege and responsibility to the very best of our ability to share God's love and message of salvation to the lost and dying world. And we know that the field certainly is wide in the harvest. We just need a lot of people to go out and work. To work in the field, to work in the vineyard. To work until he calls us home. Not let the devil get us down either. To keep a good mind about us, an attitude. Knowing all the wonderful things that he has given to us, gives to us each day and the bright future that we have beyond this bright blue that we have sung a little bit about in this one song this morning. If there's any doubt in anyone's mind about reasons for serving God, why? Count your blessings. Name them one by one. That's a project that the Lord has done, just as the psalm says. Reasons for serving God. Are we wasting our time? Are we being good for no profit? Are we doing the things that are pleasing to God and it's not going to benefit us in any way or others, just the very opposite. When we try to do God's will to the very best of our ability, when we reach out to our fellow man and try to give them a cup of water in the name of the Lord, are we not really heaping benefits upon ourselves, spiritually speaking? And there's no way that we can outgive the Lord. And I'm not talking about material things now. I'm talking about spiritual. There's no way that we can do more good than we can get. Because the more that we do, the more it will come back to us in ways that we could never even envision. Reasons for serving God. In 1 Peter, chapter 4, in verses 1 through 6, this will be used as our text for our lesson today. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, there's the example, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind, for he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. For the time past of our life may suffice us to have brought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, lust, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries, wherein 
they think it's strange that you run not with them to the same excess of riot. You that have been converted, they think it's strange that you don't continue on in those old friendships, those old ways of the world. You are now an oddity instead of one in a group. Because you can no longer run with that group doing the things that you did before and which they still practice. And make no mistake about it, they will condemn you for what? Straightening your life out? Getting right with God? Cutting out all that foolishness? For for this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead. That they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the Spirit. We're dead. You heard the expression, dead man walking? That describes someone in a penitentiary on death row. And when that day comes, that he comes to be his executioner, I'm sure this is where this came from. He's being escorted from his cell to that place of execution. Dead man walking. We, in a sense, are dead men and women walking today. Dead to the world, dead to the flesh and the desires thereof, but alive, living, really, truly living, a spiritual life Amen. animated by Jesus' redemption upon the cross through his blood. The redemption from our sins through that precious blood which was shed for the sins of the world. We accepted his gracious gift when we obeyed the gospel. Everyone could do that if they had a mind to change. They had a will to serve God instead of being selfish and self-centered. Ones that would be willing to give up whatever it takes to buy that pearl of great price. The pearl merchant as described in the Bible, he knows the gems and what they are worth. And when he sees the best, he recognizes that. His eye is discerned to see what many people would not even begin to fathom. But when he sees that perfect pearl of great price, which is the church, which is the plan of salvation, which is Jesus Christ and all that is involved therein. He goes and sells all that he has that he might have that. What's that mean? Well, you don't go to the bank and empty it out and come and say, here, Lord, here's $100,000. That's all I've got. Um, buy my salvation today. No, it doesn't work that way, does it? What the parable is telling us with a material scene that we might be able to lay it beside the spiritual and to see that whatever it takes, we should have the discernment to see the real, the genuine article and to say, that's what I want. And so we became Christians. Paul describes it this way. Those things that were before, I count them as refuse. For the excellence 
see of Jesus Christ all that he offers to us. Man has a choice. He may serve God or he may serve Satan. Someone says, well, I don't want to serve God, but I, I, I'm not serving the devil. Guess what? Jesus said, he that is not for me is against me. And if there's someone that is against Jesus, that is the devil. So you have to make your choice. You can't say, I'm going to stay in between. You can't ride the fence. They think that if they lay low on the radar scene so that the devil's not paying attention to them, not being really bad, as they would describe it themselves, I don't get drunk too much, I don't carouse too much, just a little bit. So the Lord's not really after me. Maybe he's not noticing these things. Oh, there's not a thing that is hidden. That they bear before God Almighty. In Joshua chapter 24 and verse 15, Joshua makes a challenge to the children of Israel. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve. We don't have Joshua with us today. Not that Joshua. <laughs> but we do today have to make a choice. Choose you this day who you will serve. If you say, well, I intend to do it, but later. Guess what? If you go with that attitude, you're going to go home without God. Choose you this day. And once you've made that choice and you've obeyed the gospel, you have to choose to continue on that path. Every day when you get up, Am I going to be a good boy or girl today? <laughs> Am I going to be a man or a woman for God and for Christ? Am I going to serve Him and put Him first or self? Do I get a day off from serving God? Do you want a day off from serving God? They deserve the devil. You want to serve the God, God one day and serve the devil the rest of the week? Joshua told the children of Israel, you make your choice. As for me, my house will serve the Lord. To serve Satan may bring bit of pleasure today. Pleasure to sin for a season. The devil makes it sound good. But there's one thing that we need to remember. He'll take you with that sin farther than you want to go, cost you more than you want to pay, and keep you longer than you intend to stay. In Romans chapter 6 and verse 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We know a little bit about wages. And if we're at the age of retirement, we know a little bit about that Social Security, pension check, whatever, coming through at certain times. But what about the wages of sin? Did you know that there's a payday for that? Oh, yes. Ask someone who has become addicted to drugs or alcohol or something else of an illicit nature. Ask them about the payback that comes. And they wish they could get rid of it. How did people become addicted 
seems to be through innocent means, maybe getting hooked to a legitimate pain relieving drug because of an accident or injury or something. And how hard it is to break free. And so many times it's beyond the physical addiction that they have to overcome. It is the mental part of it. The psychological impact and dependence. So that people would give up everything just for that next high. They would sell their possessions. Forsake their jobs. End up homeless, begging on the streets, prostituting themselves, thievery, whatever. That's the wages of sin, isn't it? James chapter 1, verse 13 through 15. We can't blame God, can we? God does not tempt us to do evil. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. Notice that. Any man. That's you and me, isn't it? But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. That's the Reader's Digest version, if you would, in a nutshell, of what it's all about and what happens in a very concise way. We can talk about all the intricacies day by day. But this is where it starts, and here's where it ends up. Death. Sometimes these evil habits will cause one to die physically, but it certainly will cause one to die spiritually. An eternal death, separation from God Almighty. On the other hand, to serve God means life now. The good life now? Absolutely. Hard times? Well, we're not going to be immune from illnesses, happenstances of life, tragedies, all of these things. We've all, it's a lot of living. No guarantees as far as what we're going to have to face day by day. But the guarantee is that no matter what happens with God's help we're going to be overcome. In John chapter 10 and verse 10 Jesus compares that of Satan and what he's all about, Jesus. The thief cometh not but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. <clears throat> I am come that they might have life. They might have it more abundantly. There's the abundant life now. And here after. There are so many things that God has blessed us with. As we begin the lesson, count your blessings. Can you think of something? Is there anything that you can give thanks to God for today? You know, once you start thinking about it, it's hard to, to stop. Because it can go in so many different directions. It can go inward, thanking God for the personal blessings. It can go outward for our friends and our families, our jobs, our livelihood, our health. 
just being able to enjoy God's creation. The blessings are there, aren't they? From the text, let's notice some reasons for serving God. <clears throat> Number one, <clears throat> cause of the death of Christ. We should be glad to serve God. In 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 1, For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin. <clears throat> Jesus' death was a demonstration of God's love and care for man. For God so loved the world. John 3.16 1 John chapter 4 and verse 19 We love him because he first loved us. When we begin to know God, become acquainted with God, to know Him more and more, we realize how blessed we are because of God, who He is, and what He does for us. What he means to us. God is love. God has demonstrated supreme love. Love for God will cause one to obey God. If you love me, he will keep my commandments. John chapter 14, verse 15. How about first John chapter 5 and verse 3. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. He's not put such a burden on us that they are grievous requirements. Things that grieve our being, our soul, that are so hard that we physically fall down. That we are worn out in the flesh. No. It wouldn't hurt us to work a little harder in the vineyard sometimes. And when we've done those things, God will continue to strengthen us and give us, as it were, wings as eagles that we might soar. Though the outward man perish, the inward man is renewed day by day. Romans chapter 2 and verse 4. I hope none of us would be guilty of this. That we despise the good things from God Almighty, Jesus Christ our Savior. Or despises thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. It's obvious that we have received the long suffering, the goodness of God, the time that He gave us, the opportunity to obey the gospel, to give our life to Him. It wasn't like the first time we heard it, hey, I'm on board. Paul reminded Titus to urge people to a zealous 
close my eyes, I reminded them of this. In Titus chapter 2 and verse 14, Paul writes, Who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. It is maybe a sign of the times that we are, as has happened probably throughout the generations, a peculiar people. God's people are always peculiar in a sense because we're not like the world. But this is peculiar in a good way, not in a weird way. It's a way that causes people to say, hmm, why does he or she act that way? Or why doesn't he respond like the world does? How is it that he turns to the other cheek? Loves his enemy. Prays for those who are taking advantage of them. That's the kind of peculiar people that we must be. Zealous of good works. Reason for serving God well, we see from the scripture that we studied that they had sufficiently served sin. The time passed, we walked in the ways of the Gentiles, as the scripture reads. There was, that's enough of that. It's time to move on and do the right thing. No more of this foolishness. He that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 12, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. No. We don't owe it a thing. As a matter of fact, we can be thankful that the old man has been put to death and buried and we have been resurrected from that watery grave to walk in newness of life. We're not debtors to anything of the old way. We don't owe it a thing because we have renounced it. We have been forgiven. The slave has been wiped clean. And we go from zero to God. For he that is dead is free from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Romans chapter 6, verse 7 and 8. You see how these scriptures all tie together as we get the big picture? How that if we take a scripture out of its context... Sometimes we don't understand. And we don't appreciate all that it has to say. But we're not by any means exhausting any of these scriptures and the depths and the riches of God's gracious word. We can go to that well of knowledge and always come back with our buckets full. <clears throat> Never dry, but Never a dry well. The man who suffers, this is from Adam Clark's commentary I want to share with you. The man who suffers generally reflects on his ways, is humble, fears approaching death, loathes himself because of his past iniquities, and ceases from them. For in a state of suffering, the mind loses its relish for the sins of the flesh. 
because they are bitter to him through the apprehension which he has of death and judgment. And on his application to God's mercy, he is delivered from his sin. You say what? How about this way? Let's make it easy. We're out there. We're not really caring about God. We're living to the flesh, doing the things that we want to do. And all of a sudden, we're threatened. With their physical well being and jeopardy. And we get again to think, what am I going to do? And then you realize, not a whole lot I can do. Maybe you're in the hospital, there's only so much the doctors can do, right? So you think, what else is there? To That's all. 
way it's going to work. Because without love, that's all meaningless. Jesus didn't go through a written form of service and sacrifice just to fulfill God's law. He went to that cross because he loved us. His love kept him upon that cross. When the gainsayers and such were saying, if you are the Son of God, come down off that cross. Call the angels to deliver you. You saved others, you can't even save yourself. Prove it. His love kept him on that cross. The nails couldn't hold him. It was his love. He did it because he loved you and me. Reasons for serving God, number three, so one may influence others to serve God. There was an observable and recognized change in the lives of those who had become Christians. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 4, wherein they think it strange that you run not with them to the same excess of pride, speaking evil of you. Criticism of the sinner was an admission to the change that God's people had experienced. They had turned from sin to serve God. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 9, For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. The transformation in their lives was evident. Matthew chapter 5, 14, 16. You're the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle, put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Number four reason, all must give account to God. First Peter 4, 5, we shall give account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead. Judgment is as sure as death. In Hebrews 9, 27, and as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. 2 Corinthians 5.10 For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in, the, in his body according to that he hath done whether it be good or bad. Yes, we're going to have to give an account. We must appear. We will not be judged by the criticism of sinners. We will be judged by Christ. Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 through 46 gives us a picture of the judgment scene as Jesus narrates. It will produce a separation. It will result in eternal blessings or condemnation. Matthew 25, 46. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal.
Those who had already died when Peter wrote would also face God in judgment. Everyone that has ever lived. Reasons for serving God. This should prompt us to serve God. But we must do it with reverence and respect. Hebrews 12, 28. Wherefore we, receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace, whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Let's put God first. Let us live our lives according to His will. Cease from sin. Alive in the Spirit and dead to the ways of the world. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Today is the day of salvation. Make that choice to obey the gospel. Repent of your sins, confess of saints, be baptized for the remission of your sins. The simple plan of salvation, if you believe, 